Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. Thanks for listening this week and we got another special turkey hunting episode coming up. At least here in Pennsylvania, our season is opening up for all hunters. Uh, the youth opened up just here this past Saturday, but coming up here this upcoming Saturday will be opening day for the rest of us. And I'm getting really excited for that. Turkey seem to be on fire recently. Been hearing a lot of gobblers, been seeing a lot of them. So hopefully that they cooperate on the, the first day there and and everyone stays safe with that. So I wanted to kind of continue this this talk about turkeys and brought on two guys that are good friends of mine and used to work with both of them when I worked at Bucks and Bows Archery down in Gibsonia. So these guys are hunting a little bit different style birds than I talked to Jake about recently on the last podcast. They're hunting farm country birds. So we're going to talk about that and some different tactics uh, with that instead of just, you know, the, the fact of calling birds and everything, more or less from the standpoint of gaining permission on properties and different scouting techniques that are just so different than, you know, what I'm used to and, you know, some others are, but it's a really great episode and also get into Rick's uh, recent Texas Rio hunt that he went on. So there, there's a lot of a lot of good information in here. Even get into some gear stuff from um, a bow, the bow side of things, archery side of things. And with that being said, talking about gear, I had a, a listener question about what kind of sick gear system am I running for turkey season? And I kind of wanted to run through that here quickly and the reasons for that. So. In my opinion, for most places in turkey season, you don't need a whole lot. Um, so my system is pretty much, uh, I, I'm always testing a bunch of different things and I like seeing how systems work, but for the most part, you can make it really simple. To start with the pants, I like the Ascent Pant by Sitka. It's the lightest weight pant that they have, extremely fast drying, um, and as the springtime is you know typically wet. And with a lot of rain, I don't like wearing rain pants. It's loud. And even even wearing like some of the Thunderhead gear and stuff from Sitka, I don't own them. They, they're, they are very quiet, but I just don't like wearing rain pants. So I wear a lightweight, really fast drying material that even if I do get caught in a rainstorm as I'm hiking, they'll dry themselves out. But to do that, you need to have something underneath that's also going to wick moisture. So if you're wearing cotton underwear and a cotton t-shirt, that's not going to help you at all for fast drying. So I like to wear Sitka's, their core lightweight boxers, and then the core lightweight hoodie on top. So that's my base layer up top. And for the most part, that's my outer layer as the morning goes on and the temperatures start getting up in the 60s. But a lot of times that, that temperature is kind of cold, you know, first thing in the morning. And in that case, I'm running the Kelvin Active Jacket, which if you listen to any of my podcasts back during the fall from my elk hunt, that's like my most used piece and my favorite piece from Sika's big game line. So I, the reason for that is it's kind of like a lightweight puffy jacket, but you can wear it and it breathes it really well packs down the size of a softball so it virtually can go away in your turkey vest or in my case i always carry a pack still throw it in your pack anything else um and but first thing in the morning as you're walking in in the dark get to your listening spot getting set up you can wear that and you're not going to get overheated on the hike in so those few pieces of gear are the biggest things that that i'm using for turkey season sometimes i'll throw in the flash hoodie as for some rain gear even though that's not completely gore-tex so it's not 100 percent waterproof it has taped seams in the wind stopper material and that is that is enough for me for any thunderstorm that you can have even ones that last for over an hour i've never had it soak through and so i'm not I'm not saying you can't get wet in it because you definitely could. It's not 100% Gore-Tex, but 
and for what I've used it for, it's been awesome. And again, it only weighs like six ounces, very lightweight, disappears in your pack. It is loud. Um, so the only thing that I warn you there is it's not something you're going to really want to be set up in or just be careful with your movements. But to save you for to keep you out in the woods a little bit longer, it's well worth it, in my opinion. So those are the, the clothing pieces that I'm using there. And so I kind of mentioned that I run a pack where most people run in turkey vests. But for me, if I'm hiking back in a ways, uh, sometimes I like to carry a decoy, sometimes I don't. And if I'm carrying a decoy, I'm throwing them right in the back of my mountain hauler. And in that case, also, you're carrying a bird out a long ways, you can just put it right in the back of your pack like you'd be hauling meat, but in, and just with the, the turkey in there. And that, that kind of just gives me a bunch of options. Sometimes I run a water bladder. Sometimes I just run a Nalgene with some water filtration systems. But... You know, it kind of seems like it might be overkill for turkey hunting if you're only going out for half a day or whatever that might be. But for me, that system works really well. And I've run my Kafaru doing the same thing. Any sort of, you know, framed pack or one with bigger cubic inches, I I just like running those packs just for just about everything. I've tried just doing the turkey vest method, and I don't really have a very good turkey vest. One I picked up on clearance before that's a little bit too big for me so maybe that's the reason that I, I don't like to use it that much but normally I just carry my pack and then a butt pad with me and I'm able to put calls in in different pockets or or whatever else I, I play with a bunch of different different methods there so but anyways that's coming up here opening day here the end of this week I'm gonna try to get out before work a few mornings this week to listen See if I can locate some more birds, see where they're roosting at specifically, and go from there. So let's get into the partners of the the podcast here. Elk 101 and Corey Jacobson have developed the University of Elk Hunting, which is a fully comprehensive course for elk hunting from beginners to experts all the way through this course just goes through all the material from the standpoint of planning the hunt, which can be the most overwhelming process, to scouting, to fitness, gear, calling, different situational setups, packing meat, all the way through those different systems there, there are modules, as Corey calls them. Check, the, check out that course, and it's a year membership. You could pick it up. For normally, it'd be a hundred dollars for a year. If you use the code East Meets West, you can get that for eighty dollars. I've said it on here before, but I've used it now for three years. I've purchased it myself, and I thought it would be a really good fit for everyone to to learn from to really up their game with elk hunting this year. In addition to that, Maven Optics. So Maven, as I just did the last podcast with two of the owners, Cade and Mike, uh, Maven has, their vision was to come out with the highest quality optics at a price of half of their competitors. They're not worried about staying, they're not worried about growing extremely big and trying to compete with some of these other brands. What they're trying to do is come out with those High quality optics using the direct to consumer business model. So cutting out the middleman, keep those prices down, and be able to give the customer service that we all want from a company that we're supporting. When you pick up the phone and you call them for any reason, you're getting a real person on the line that's going to be able to help you out, whether that's a warranty issue or if that's just a question on, you know, which one which optics are best for your setup. They're all hunters. They all know what they're looking for, what you're looking for in the field you're not going to some call center you're getting real people so check out maven optics um and their full line of rifle scopes spotting scopes and binoculars and use code east meets west dash gift at checkout on any full price optics order and you'll get a free gift with that order so check them out at mavenbuilt.com and lastly heather's choice so Heather has created these backcountry healthy meal options and snacks for anyone that's hiking, hunting, adventuring, traveling, whatever that might be, camping. These meals 
are really high in protein and fats to fuel your body, make your muscles less sore after a hard day of working, and be able to do that without filling it with a bunch of sodium and, and preservatives, anything like that. You just add hot water to them, to the meals, the breakfast, and the dinners, and they're ready to eat in just 15, 20 minutes. And then with uh, the snack options, which is what they have, are the pack runes. The pack runes are now coming out little single-serving packets. Um, each one of those little, I, I call them uh, coconut cookies, each one of those coconut cookies or pack runes is packing 160 calories and it's amazing that something that small and that tastes that good can give you that many calories to be able to fuel you on any of your adventures. So check them out and use code East Meets West on any orders over $99 to get free shipping. Coming straight from Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. And if your order doesn't meet $99, uh, no fret. You just want to check it out. Still use the link in our website. So just click on the logo there and that will take you through the link. And that will really help us out from our standpoint. All right. With that being said, let's get into this podcast here with Rick and Alec. Bush. 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 (laughs) Bo, tell everybody what just happened to you. Well, I got peaked again. My bush can, the mountains line up with the the mouth hole, so that means... The mouth hole. <laughs> the mouth hole. <laughs> Is that what it's called? <laughs> just Mouthpiece. Without, I'm not really sure what it would be called, but the mouth hole just seems... So you're going to have to take care of this intro, Rick. I got business to do. What am I supposed to say? Welcome to the East Meets West podcast. <laughs> East Meets West Hunt podcast. Introduce everybody that's here. Okay, so... W- this podcast is Turkey Talk. We have Alec Nebel. Hello. Turkey extraordinaire. You were a uh, NWTF, what, amateur, junior, junior turkey um, calling champion? No, it was more, we did Pennsylvania Grand Nationals. That would have been geez, probably like 10 years ago. Um, I placed second. It wasn't anything big. It was mostly local stuff. If you're not first, you're last. If not first, you're last. Ricky but Bobby. You're still good. Yeah. I did pretty good. I like killing corner. my judges, so yeah. I don't know. That's how it works. Get rid of that. <laughs> now we have Bo Martiniak over here. Bo. I'm here. I'm here. I'm the host, but you're taking over, actually. No. You're not going to do that? No. All right. So, Rick, you've been on here before. I'd rather not, you know, go through your whole backstory again. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. Yeah, preferably not. Yeah. And, Alex, so do you want to give a little background on yourself here first? Well, known these guys for quite some time. Uh, Rick, I've known him for, what, 11 years? Something like that. Bo, I've known you quite a long time, too. Um, but grew up just north of Pittsburgh, about an hour. Um, met Rick when he was in college and uh, met you up there, too, I think. Slippery oh, Rock. Slippery Rock, yeah. Um, I know, I've been hunting since I was a little kid, 12 years old, in Pennsylvania. So um, really took a liking to the turkey hunting, I guess, that. uh I don't know. I got really good at that. So, um, stuck with that and that's been pretty much it. I mean, you do deer hunt. I do deer hunt. There's you don't, tur- you don't deer kill. I don't deer. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, I get lucky every once in a while, but, um, you killed one this year. Yeah. Killed a doe. Decent. Yep. So, Freezer queen. Freezer queen. So where are you from, Alex? I live up in Volant, Pennsylvania now, Amish country. But uh, I grew up in Slippery Rock, and I've been there while well, I was there since, well, I don't know. I was like five years old. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much yeah, it. Yeah, the way I know Alec is when, when Rick first introduced me to him as basically a turkey assassin, if you want to put it that way. Turkey thug. Turkey thug. Turkey thug, thug anything like serial that. Serial killer. Yeah. yeah, turkey serial killer, whatever you want. I mean... I, I better stop. Well, we were outside, so if his head swells up, he won't get stuck through doorways yeah, like he normally does. He's going to break your headphones. Yeah. <laughs> Snap them. Yeah. But, yeah, so I've known Alec now for a few years since when I came down here, started working at the bow shop. And, and again, for those of you who don't know Rick from the last couple podcasts, he was uh, my store manager and still is the store manager of Bucks and Bows Archery down here in Gibsonia. And we're... uh Pennsylvania, we're sitting here at his house right now. They should probably go listen to the other podcast too. 
They should hit pause on this one, go back to the other ones, listen to them. If they go back and listen to them ones, they're definitely not going to listen to this one. They'll be sick. That's of your true. Listen to this point. one first, and then yeah. the other ones later. Yeah, if they, yeah, that's it's going to be tough. Rick's not an easy one to listen to for a long period of time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, so guys, we're sitting here. Like I said, it's a nice, nice evening here in yep. April. Perfect spring day. 68 degrees, sunshine, bush lattes. They're flowing. Flowing. And the deer burgers you just cooked were out of this world. They were good. (laughs) Unreal. (laughs) Unreal. Jalapeno. I'm not going to tell anybody. Secret recipe. They were good. They have gelatinous. You can't give out the secret recipe on here. You can go down to Bucks and Bows and buy them for a good price. Hit me up on IG. Slip into my DMs. I might get you some (laughs) ingredients going. Uh, that works. Yeah, all right. Is that how you say that stuff? I mean, was that I? That yeah, was, that you, was right. You're hip. Yeah. Slide, <laughs> slip in or slide into my DM. Whatever. Oh, slide in. Yeah. Slip into your mouth hole. Yeah. <laughs> Did you chuck that yet, Bo? Hey, come on. I'm trying to. I'm trying to coordinate this podcast here. I know. I'm going to. So once I get Rick here talking, right, we'll be good. So <laughs> We, yeah, we also we also have some uh, spectators. Yeah. This is live podcast. <laughs> Royley Benson, <laughs> Clint Burkholder. Oh man, yeah. Riley was here for the last. Riley's couple. crying <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, Riley was here for the last couple that we. Recorded. What are you laughing about? Slip into your mouth hole comment. Just all of you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Just So, Rick, you uh, you recently just got back from a hunt in Texas. I did. Yep. It was a blast. So, <clears throat> we went uh, went down there with some people um, in the industry, the guys from Tight Spot, Black Gold, Sights, Ripcord, Rests. Um, so, we went down on uh, kind of like a dealer hunt. Um, dude, it was honestly probably the most fun I've had, like on a – on a traveling hunting trip like out of state you know whatever i mean i love deer hunting in illinois that's fun we've hunted in ohio been to kentucky a couple places but just overall like fun of the hunt because it was pretty low stress we had a blast but uh yeah about hour and a half west of san antonio hill country texas which i was not prepared for i was kind of thinking like flat desert tumbleweeds we get down there and it's like mountains and well not, not mountains but I mean pretty good size hills and stuff. It was it was cool. It was a lot of fun. It was a hog and turkey hunt. Okay. So what made this type of hunt so much fun? Well, just the way it's laid out. I mean it's not like you're not you don't have to wake up at like four o'clock in the morning and go sit in a tree stand all day or go hike around the mountains or whatever. It was pretty you know, I don't it was like a gentleman style hunt, you know what I mean? It was pretty low key as far as uh, difficulty was concerned. Still pretty adventurous, and I'm gonna, you know, pretty much use it to to dev- define my adventure. You know? Hey, that w- wow, that was pretty good. I had a slide. What that. part of Texas was that again? So near Sabinal. So the ranch we were on is called the Two Morrow Ranch. So the number two and then Morrow M O R R O W. Um, Thanks for spelling that out for us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. M A R R. I mean, you could probably spell it a couple different ways. Can I? Conti- can continue. I continue? Thanks. Yeah, you're allowed. So the Two Morrow Ranch. Um, Bill Morrow's the owner. Um, these guys are. I mean, they're awesome. Best people. I mean, you know, talk about like Texas Southern hospitality. Um, just really friendly people. Really welcoming into their place. The lodge is five stars. Is beautiful. Um, they have like freaking arcade games. They had Big Buck Hunter and golf galaxy or whatever that thing's called it looked like a blast freaking shuffleboard pool poker ping pong full bar spent a lot of time there um it was you? just really nice like really high-end place so like loved it a lot and then riley's their head guide um and he's he's top notch too so guys know what they're doing they know how to hunt I mean, they pretty much know they live there, you know, they know every square inch of this property. It's thousands and thousands of acres. So they have a high fence. So if, you know, for guys that like to go down, they have exotic stuff, you know, and they obviously do like high fence white tails. They, they raise their own white tails there, which is kind of cool to see that process. I hadn't really seen that sort of live action. Um, and then they have low fence. So that's all free range stuff. 
Um, obviously, high fence and low fence, the turkeys are free range because they have wings. Um, but, and then tons of hogs and javelinas. Um, so we pretty much hunted the low fence most of the time. At least I ended up over there. Um, they have, you know, white tails over there, free range, black buck. Um, there's odd dad, all that kind of stuff. So pretty cool target rich environment for sure. Did you get to see a bunch of those other? Pretty much saw everything like African, right? I don't know. It seemed like everything was from Africa. I kept calling like, hey, there's something from Africa right there. And the guys would make fun of me. They're like, that's a black oryx. And I'm like, oh. They're like, and that's not from Africa. Maybe that one is, but there was a bunch of stuff that was not African. That <laughs> It all looks African. It's all exotic. Yeah, so, yeah. Neil guy, and uh, we, we saw those black oryx. Um, the odd ad are cool, you know, because they, they're like a sheep, you know, yeah. with the curls. So we saw some of those, which is pretty neat. Um the black buck look like a gazelle, but I guess they're from like India. I, Something somebody yeah, was I have telling no me. Yeah. So I, I just heard of someone hunting them in Texas recently, and dude, heard them on another podcast. It was really interesting. To kill one with a bow, like spot and stock, yeah, would be a feat. Yep. I mean, they are unbelievably. They're super fast, super skittish. You know, very wary. I mean, people think like high fence, and they you know they would assume it's pretty easy hunt, right? Because animals are fenced in but you're talking about let's say three thousand acres fenced in yeah i was just about to ask how many thousands of acres i mean they were in. you know these animals are they have tons of room it's not like this little 20 acre pen or something like that and they don't see a lot of humans and they're super super skittish to everything so you could drive by like on a side by side and they'll kind of watch you maybe from 100 yards or so but the second your feet step on the ground outside that side by side i mean if that side by side stops and you step out they're gone they run hmm. so and they're obviously you know like white tails and elk and everything you got to watch the wind so um i see them like turkeys you know i mean you could drive past the field hundreds of times in a car and uh, as soon as you open the door or even stop your car yeah look at them they start getting weird they they know something's up they, yeah so it was cool um like i said pretty much in the mornings you'd get up go out to blinds do some turkey hunting the amount of rios down there is crazy um, i mean to go down to that ranch I, I can't speak for anywhere else but for that ranch specifically if you go down there and you're looking to take a rio off your slam nwtf slam that that's the place to do it because if you go in three days you don't kill a rio you either didn't bring ammo <laughs> didn't didn't bring a, a gun or a bow or totally screwed up <laughs> can't sit still yeah something i mean you <laughs> messed up bad um, i mean, still turkey hunting now that I say that, and I mean if you're focused on turkey hunting the entire time. Yeah. So, obviously, the guys that were with us, not everybody killed a turkey, but guys were spending half their time or probably three-quarters of their time hunting, you know, axis deer and all those other – some of those other exotics. And then the evenings, right, we, we would pig hunt. So, mornings, turkey hunt, come back for breakfast. The food was crazy. The chef that was there cooking was incredible. Um, and for the afternoon, you pretty much do what you want. So this is like the cool part. You get up, you don't have to get up early because you're not, you know, they're driving you to where you're going. So it's not like you have to hike a mile or anything like that. Um, so you get some sleep, do some turkey hunt in the morning. You'll hear birds all the time. I mean, everywhere you go, you hear turkeys and you, everywhere I went, I, I was able to, you know, you at least see them. And then you come back to the lodge, like nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock eating breakfast and then after that, it's up to you. If you want to go fishing, they got stocked ponds, catfish, bass, perch, whatever. They got the fishing rods, everything for you. So if you want to spend the afternoon fishing, if you want to spend the afternoon sleeping, you can do whatever you want. So, but we I, we wanted to be out there hunting, you know, at least trying to kill something. So we'd go spot and stock for the afternoon, and so we'd get up in the side by side, and Riley would drive us up into that that hill country stuff. Just beautiful scenery too. But you'd see hogs or javelinas or you know, black buck or whatever, and plan the stock. There you go. If Once you saw them, it was like, okay, check the wind. What are we going to do? We got some javelinas on the second day, which is pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, it's just you're constantly seeing game. It's 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 pretty fun. But, again, it's not like the easiest hunt in the world. I mean, you don't just walk up to animals and shoot them. Yeah. No, was it uh, – no, to kind of go back a little bit, you were talking about the high fence, low fence thing, and that's something that – when I always thought of high fence, I picture like some of those places in other states that are these small places. People go and shoot these three hundred inch white tails, right, and right. and then recently I was informed by someone else about the way Texas does these type hunts. Almost everything, and I, 
someone can correct me on this, which I'm sure they will, um, that uh, most of it is either high or low fence the way that it is. But there's such big acreage like that. Again, I've changed my views on that over the years, yep. depending on the situation, you know, that that's not, it's not just like shooting a, a, a fish in a bucket type deal, no, you know? not at all. I mean, when we were down there, I made a joke. I'm like, all right, I'm moving to Texas and I'm starting a fencing company <laughs> because <laughs> everything is fenced. Everything. And uh, it, there's two parts to that, right? So your low fences are literally like maybe I'm guessing three feet off the ground. Mm-hmm. Like your regular so, chain link fence, do, pretty much. Yeah. Kind of height-wise. Yeah, or, okay. yeah, whatever, or, or barbed wire or something. Uh, but deer, whatever, jump right over. It's only three feet off the ground. The, I think Basically the, a property boundary. Pretty much, right? I think the main point of that, so hogs are a big issue in Texas. We all know that. There's two things they want to do. One, keep hogs, other hogs, out of their property so that they can, once they can keep their hogs in, you can now control them. You can now monitor them. You can now put feeders out and get them into areas where hunters can kill them because the hogs do so much damage that they need to have control over their ground. And if they don't have a three foot fence up, little hogs can come and go, more hogs can come in. And now it's a total free for all, right? So at least with a low fence on some of those ranches, they're able to control those hog populations, monitor their populations, keep them there, hunt them, do that, right? The high fence, obviously, because Texas, the environment is um, suitable for exotics, right? You can't have like a black buck survive or an axis to your survive in Pennsylvania winters. They would die. Yeah. Their bodies aren't designed to handle that cold, right? So Texas has the, the you know, the um, the weather, whatever you want to say. To, the climate. The climate, yeah, exactly, to, to have those animals thrive. So they put the high fence in and, hey, dude, I mean, you build it and they'll come, right? I mean, if people are going to pay... If your business down there, if you went 3,000 acres, you know, you're not going to build a strip mall down there because it's vast land. I mean, it's not like there's high population areas, where we're, at least where we were, right? So, I know, I know you said the town, but what uh, what area of Texas? Southern? South, southern, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pr- pr- pretty south. Like I said, San Antonio is kind of, you know, like that big sort of like triangle at the bottom of Texas? Yeah. Like upside down triangle. It's like down there. Okay. Sort of to the left ish. But West, uh, yeah. Southwest. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, hill country. But yeah, so fence <laughs> it in, put the exotics in. It's business, man. Yeah. People are gonna pay to do it. It's business. So like I said though, we have we have high fence ranches here in Pennsylvania, not far from here. And yeah, they may only be like a hundred to three hundred acre maybe you know, we're talking totally different. And we're talking about deer that you know probably get a lot of human interaction and things like that so in texas it's not like that and it did kind of change my mind a little bit it was a sort of an eye-opener learning experience for me to like you said sort of adjust my views as far as southern high fence hunting personally would i go down there and kill a big whitetail that was high fence pen raised whatever probably not but would i go down there and kill some exotic stuff the meat's delicious. You know, you got axis deer and these black orcs and Neil guys like phenomenal meat. So, and it's, a, you know, you kill a the black orcs or a Neil guy, dude, the size of horses. It's a lot of really good meat. So, you know, you go down there, something like that. Sure. My main goal was to go down there and kill a Rio turkey. That was goal number one. And the backside of that finished up with let's shoot as many hogs as we can. That was an archery hunt only, no guns. Um, so. And you, you did shoot a Rio. I know you, you talked about if you, if you didn't kill one you know you ha- might have had an issue or two that you ran into but so you did end up taking a rio then yeah yep a um, special one the i guess that would have been Not the first that night was the first night yeah, i was gonna say yeah, it was, was the in, in the evening um so yeah, anyway so you go spot and stock in the afternoon and then in the evening you come back eat dinner and then for the evening you could go out about six o'clock sit in tree stands or blinds over feeders and you're waiting for the hogs. The hogs could come in at last light. They could come in when it's still dark. We have these red lights that you would hook to your stabilizer, which is pretty neat and way more difficult than I thought it was going to be trying really? to see through your peep sight and see a pin at night under a red light. I thought that was going to be pretty straightforward and it's not. It's actually pretty hard, especially when you're aiming at a black hog. If the animals are like lighter, it'd be different. Um, which I did get into that. We can, we'll talk about that in a bit, but 
So anyways, yes, we get down there first morning, go out, heard some birds gobbling, didn't get into, into anything. And then that, that, that first night. So, um, we go over to actually wasn't even, I don't even think it was on the low fence or the high fence. It was this other property that we had permission to hunt uh, a family, I think somehow related to the owner of the lodge there and said, yep, you guys can Turkey hunt here. So went in and you could just tell immediately it was more Turkey country, Creek bottom, super green, thicker, you know, kind of sort of almost looked like Pennsylvania. So we're driving these, you know, they drive, everybody drive down the drives like a big lifted truck, you know, big tires, lift kit. So we, we get into this spot and we cross this sort of like Creek, either really big Creek or really small river. However you want to look at it, probably, I don't know, 20, 25 yards wide, maybe I could totally be exaggerating that, but that's how I remember it. Um, <laughs> and, and fairly deep. It's a podcast and you can say whatever you want, really. Right, until Riley or one of these guys from the lodge listens, and he's like, oh, it's actually five yards wide. Well, that's um, like but, Bo saying he doesn't kill elk, but really he does. Right. Shh, that shh, don't tell everybody oh, that. Can't, <laughs> yeah, keep that quiet. <laughs> so we cross, this, we cross this creek river, get up the other side. They got a blind. It's like mesquite blind type thing, kind of homemade deal. And so I get in, and the, so the truck drives away, and it, they have like feeders on the front of the trucks that stick out like on a trailer hitch. And they rattle, you know, and they hit bumps. And so he gets across that creek. I hear him go up to, he, this truck isn't even probably 100 yards from me. Hits a bump, and that feeder kind of like bang, bang, you know, off the front of the truck. It shakes. And freaking Rio gobbles like 50 yards behind me. I'm like, I don't have even set up yet. I'm not even ready. I don't even arrow knock, nothing. I'm standing in the blind. No decoy out. So I'm like, holy crap. So I, you know, I knock an arrow, grab my call you know, start calling, he's gobbling, next thing you know, like, within three minutes, this bird's at 15 yards, I can hear him behind me, I can hear him spit drumming, actually, so close, so I'm sitting there, and he's like, mm. I'm like, oh, man, this bird's, like, right here, and he's gobbling 15 yards, you know, so I'm all fired up, so I'm sitting there, and he just stands at, like, 50, I can't see him, because it's so thick behind me, but I know he's right here. I can hear him walking. You know, it's ever pretty loud in Texas, so I can hear him walking and spit drumming. Next thing you know, he gobbles. He's like a hundred yards away. I'm like, what the heck? So I, you know, grab my call, call again. He gobbles, call again. He gobbles. Next thing you know, boom, back to 15 yards behind me again. I'm like, what is this turkey doing? So he keeps hanging up. So long story short, he does this like two, three times. So the third time, third or fourth time, I get out of the blind. I'm like, I'm going to get out and just go behind me and hide behind some cactus. And when he comes in, I'm going to shoot him. I don't know what he's hanging up on. Why well, I get back there and like 10, 15 yards behind the blinds, this little barbed wire fence. So he's getting to that fence and just, he won't cross it. He can't cross it, you know? So he's just strutting there. So whatever, he he comes back. I couldn't get a shot. And I'm like running around. And then I finally, I'm like, dude, calm down. Like get back in the blind, relax. There was another bird goblin not too far from us too. So I get back in the blind. I'm sitting there, make a couple calls. He had gone down to my right. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, next thing I know, I look out through this, like, mesquite, you know, blind him in. And this bird's, like, six yards standing there. On Now on my side of this barbed wire fence. So I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's right here. So he starts to come out right into the opening of the blind. And I go to draw my bow. And again, see through, sort of blind. And he catches me. He starts alert putting. So at full draw, so he comes back to my left. I can't shoot him. I'm like, you know, I'm at full draw looking at him through brush. And I just follow him to my left. And I'm like, all right, I'll shoot him out of the back of the blind. So he gets to the opening, alert putts, comes back again. I've been at full draw now for like probably, you know, at least a minute. And I'm kind of at a weird angle sitting on this chair. And he comes back and finally he gets back into the opening in the front of the blind. A little further though, like 15, 20 yards. And I shoot and I hit him low. Immediately, it was like that, you know, you know, when you shoot, and you're not real confident in your shot. You're like, oh, like shit, like not a good shot. So you might hear my heart sinks, you know, like, oh my gosh. So he kind of flies, he's flopping around, he starts running down this road that we drove up on. So I get out of the blind, knock another arrow. I was shooting those rage turkey heads. Mm -hmm. Normally it would, you know, wouldn't pass through, but I hit them low. So I went through them. So at least it's a big cut. And I get out of the blind to shoot him, and he starts running, flies across this river creek thing, right? And he goes up and flies right into this big, like, oak tree or whatever. Now, you know, it's very green down there right now. It looks like June here in Pennsylvania. 
So he flies like into the canopy of the tree. I hear him, you know, crash. And then I hear this, you know, big thud, boom. So I'm like, what the hell? I'm standing on the edge of this like river. I'm like, what the hell just happened? I think he, I think he hit the ground is what it sounded like. Maybe hit that tree and then hit, hits the ground. I'm standing with my bow. I'm like, well, I guess I got to cross this river creek whatever i'm wearing freaking six inch solomon half mile wide creek yeah yeah about three <laughs> quarters three quarter mile <laughs> so i'm like i'm wearing six inch solomon 4d boots whatever you know sick of mountain pants i'm like oh god i have no idea how deep it is so i get about halfway out there about knee deep maybe a little over my knees i'm just like crossing this thing. It's totally soaked boots full of water get up the other side i'm trying to be sneaky but it's like quick, 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 every every step you know, <laughs> like the sound of water in my boots so i get up to this tree and i draw my bow and i'm looking i'm kind of like slowly walking at full draw and i'm looking and all of a sudden boom he's right here he's at three yards i looked i i looked right past him he was laying dead upside down three yards from me crazy i couldn't believe it so yeah he died so i get him got to cross this freaking creek again because there's no phone reception so i gotta go get my radio so i cross this uh creek again when i get up the other side there's just blood the whole way down the road from him flying and it was just like a blood trail from him flying down that roadway so so you you said you shot him low did you shoot him like kind of where the like the legs kind of met the body or kind of like just in front of that okay. so hit something good yeah two inch cut broadhead he did know, so did his job but uh yeah he did so, yeah, triple beard. I think it was like 10 and 7 eighths, 11, 11 inch for the longest beard. And then I didn't measure the other two there. One was long, and then the next one was smaller. But uh, triple beard, just under probably inch spurs. Um, but, yeah, first Rio. That's pretty First awesome. Rio I ever had in range. First Rio I ever shot. First Rio I ever hunted. Killed it with a bow. I was super pumped, man. Yeah, it was that's... like dream come true. As a turkey hunter and an avid turkey hunter, you know, that's like a – bucket list dream oh, yeah. come true man it was it was i was beside myself yeah that's so cool and and there are you know a ton of opportunities you know in places like texas stuff before and i you know a lot of times on the podcast and stuff i talk about you know western states and everything else and there's places like that and and even with that being you know a fully outfitted hunt you can do that relatively cheap right yeah so <sighs> If you want, if you're, it depends on what you want to go for. Yeah. Right? So these hunts are, you know, I don't want to say menu hunts, but like I said before, it's target rich. So you could go down there on a turkey hunt. It's like 250 bucks a day. So you go on a three day hunt, it's $750. Not bad, right? Now you got to, you know, that's your lodging and stuff too. So now you got to pay for airfare. You know what I mean? Your tags out of state wasn't bad. I think it was around think, 200 if you think bucks. About $250 a day, and that's including lodging and your meals, right? <laughs> Meals maybe a little more, um, but even for lodging, I'm not sure. you go to a night, you go to a city, and you get a hotel room, and you're looking at you know that kind of price. Sure, yep, you yeah, know. it's super reasonable, mm -hmm. um, and the flights weren't bad from from Pittsburgh. You know, you got layovers and stuff, but I think flights were caught three hundred bucks round trip, tags under two hundred, I think, right around two, so. You know, all in, it's 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 a pretty inexpensive hunt. Now, when you get there, and all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, there's axis deer." You're like, "Well, that's three grand." <laughs> and I want a hog hunt. Well, that's an extra three hundred bucks a day. You know, so either either yeah. bring your checkbook with you if you're okay with it. <laughs> if you're not okay with it, make sure it stays at home so you don't have the opportunity to be writing checks. Because when you're there and you're excited, you know, guys are starting to pull checkbooks out. Kind of like, maybe I do want to kill an axis deer. I'm, I'm in Texas. I'm here. Yeah. I don't <laughs> when know when in I'll Texas. be back, you know. So, but yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, it is reasonable. That that ranch specifically is beautiful. Great people. They, they know what they're doing. Um, and the, as far as a turkey hunter, man, every time I sat, evening and mornings, Pretty much, I think every single time, except for the first morning, I visually saw a long beard. Um, every morning, I heard them. Every evening, I heard them. So, uh, lots of birds, and they're beautiful, and it's great weather. Hey, you can get hunting turkeys well before your PA or Ohio or whatever season comes. Yeah, hey, you were in. there at the end of March, weren't you? Yeah, we got there. I think the last day of March, and hunted till April third. I think it's our was our last day, something like that. 
Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, we, our season here doesn't come until the end of April. So, yeah. and the hog hunting's pretty, pretty fun too. I mean, it's over feeders and the feeders go off and they pretty much are like clockwork. Boom! Not they're not going to come in every night, but I was lucky every time I hunted them. I was luckily in a place they wanted to be and they came in. Um, good meat, fun hunting. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Did you get to cook up any of the meat while you were down there? No. So, you know, they'll, they cape it and quarter it for you, debone it. So we pretty much just froze it in Ziploc bags, all the meat, um, then the turkey fan and everything and the breasts. And then on the way to the airport, the last day we went to Walmart and got a $15 igloo cooler, filled it with the meat and like bubble wrap and stuff. So it didn't bounce around and yeah. duct taped it up and got to the airport. She's like, what's in the cooler? I was checking in. <laughs> I'm like, a hog and a turkey. She's like, excuse me? I was like, well, I mean, hog meat and, a, and turkey parts. She's like, oh, okay. I guess I shouldn't have asked. I'm like, well, you asked. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's there. I'm like, it's all frozen. You know, she's like, okay, that's fine. They don't really give you a h- tough time in say, Texas. Is it difficult to travel with, with nope. all that stuff? When you're flying out of Texas to come home, they don't give you a hard time. They want you to come down there. They have such a hog problem that they're not going to give you a hard time for it. Mm-hmm. You know, one, you're bringing money to their state. So it's an economy boost to, to offer hunts. And two, they need their hogs killed. So they're not going to give you a hard time. Um, they did, when I got back to Pittsburgh and I got my, oh, my luggage, I noticed that somebody had cut the duct tape on my cooler and then they retaped it with like a clear packing tape. And I look in and all the Ziploc, all the bags, the big trash bags were all opened. So I could only imagine looking on their face and they, like the pig head was in there because I was going to get a year. I get a year amount done first hog. <laughs> so I'm like, can you imagine ripping open a trash bag and there's, you know, hair and everything still on it. Eyeballs still in it. They, boom. There's a hog head. I'm like, yeah, they got a surprise there. Yeah. But United Airlines, you know, I guess T- the TSA people really uh, earned their paycheck. <laughs> yeah. That day. Oh, yeah. That would have been surprising, but. Yeah, it only cost me 150 bucks, which is cool. So whoever the CEO of United's probably the ship sit, the meat sitting back. at his that's what it was sitting on his beach house down in down on the islands. Just got another 150 bucks out of me to ship a freaking cooler home. Check it in. So <laughs> yeah, but that's awesome, man. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Like I said, a big part of traveling for me now that I've had not a ton of experience, but enough experience traveling to different states and hunting different outfitters and stuff like that is. It's got to be the right outfitter. The people have to be good. It has to be um, comfortable. You know, you're away from home. You're away from your wife or kids or whatever. It's sort of almost already uncomfortable a little bit. Um, so it's nice when you have a place that makes you feel comfortable and it's high end and the people are welcoming and friendly. And so that was the best part. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Good. That sounds awesome. I was I was pumped to hear the story. I told you when we talked on the phone, I wasn't asking you any questions because I wanted to hear it. Yeah. You know, first here first on the hand. podcast. So. Equipment held up well, too. We, uh, like I said, we were down there with some 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 companies, um, Tight Spot being one of them, Tight Spot Quivers, which, you know, you pretty much everybody sitting here around this podcast uses. Yeah. Um, they're obviously worth the money. Lifetime warranty. Yeah. Um, yeah, the people they, there are amazing. You shoot with the quiver on, and it's not a burden. It keeps everything tight to your bow. And, yep, and you can actually, you know, tilt that quiver and lower it or raise it or do whatever you want. It's pretty much unlimited adjustment so that you can balance it. And I don't do a lot of spot and stock hunting. This is pretty much my first opportunity when we were hunting in the afternoons to spot and stock. And so it's a bit of a learning experience for me to, you know, as a white tail hunter, normally take my quiver off and hang it up, right? Well, this is one of those times where you could take that quiver and actually utilize it to help balance your bow, kind of using it as a stabilizer, right? To yeah. balance your sight and everything else. So um, lots of adjustment there. The black gold sights, I mean, super durable. And we put them to the test. I mean, they're bouncing off side by sides and, you know, walking through that mesquite and stuff like that. And they held up nice nice and tight and durable. Um, and obviously Ripcore, they've been around for a long time and super reliable rest. That new lock rest they have which is a sort of hybrid it's limb driven which is essentially maybe a little more reliable than a cable driven rest um because that limb's forcing the rest down versus utilizing inertia from the cable moving quickly um so having a limb force it down right maybe make it a little more um, reliable but it locks up just like a qad or something would a, a normal 
mm-hmm. you know, cable driven rest. So when you're hunting, it's locked up, your arrow's contained. However, so kind of where like the problem that I don't want to say a problem, but the, a weakness with like that ham ski I just put on my yeah. bow is the arrow is down. It's fully captured, but it's laying down on your shelf. Yeah, it so can now bounce I have around. To, yeah, to put, yep. well, today I was down the shop getting my bow set up, and as I'm letting up, you know, but. <laughs> arrow flops off the the end of it pretty easily because it's just bouncing around it's not contained sure. as my qad did or as this new rip cord so the rip cord you know, lock as, would be like a hybrid a combination between the benefits of a qad and the benefits of a limb driven like a hamski yeah it's a combination of two they have the micro and non-micro adjust they're pretty sweet i mean they're sweet I, yeah. definitely worth looking at if you guys are if anyone listening is looking to get a new arrow rest or just change it up check out the ripcord lock it is it's awesome and you can do you can adjust the tension um and like kind of the uh the drop away function of it in the field so if you're in the field in colorado as long as you have a little allen key with you you can make those adjustments on the fly so um where like a qad you'd mean i'm most like need a bow press or something like well that's it's it's funny and just for everyone's reference here again if you haven't listened to the podcast it with rick in the past with him talking about you know he manages an archery shop so basically he can choose whatever equipment he wants to shoot so what he's shooting is something that he knows is going to be good i mean rick you get to test all the companies basically Mm -hmm. you carry whatever products again i worked there firsthand i know everything was hand-picked chosen you know for the the customers and and then you're going to shoot, you know, whatever you feel is good for your application, right? Yeah. I mean, unlike a box store or Amazon, um, you know, our customer service and feedback and things like that's super important for us because they're going to come right. If, if we provide something or give them a product that's going to fail or not be reliable and they have an issue with it, they're coming right back in. It's face to face, right? So now I got to deal with an unhappy customer, which we obviously strive to not have. Thank you, Riley. And... And then, you know, have to replace the product or whatever. And so to avoid that, might as well just start with something reliable and something that you don't have to worry about, and that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and being able to go field test things, yes, I'm in a privileged position to be able to do that. Very lucky to have the opportunity to do that and to have these relationships with these companies. Um, but it's fun to do it, too. You know, it's fun to put things to the test and see how far you can push your product. Uh, and give your feedback and... and- See, you know, whatever. It was a big part of that hunt, too. So we had a meeting on the last day where we all sat down with the people from those companies. Um, And, you know, these are people that are high up in those companies. This isn't, you know, somebody that, you know, I don't know, not saying that the person who runs social media for somebody's company isn't important because they are. But these are like, you know, national sales managers and people that are like running those businesses in those companies. And they sat down and said, give us your feedback. We want the negative. Don't sit here and sugarcoat this and give us, oh, yeah, you're, you make the best products in the world. Thank you. You know, and throw a sticker on the back of my truck, and now I'm field staff. <laughs> they want to know. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. We, yeah, dude. Had to. <laughs> they want to know what's wrong. They want to know how they can better that product. And not every company does that, right? So there's only certain companies for us that stand out that actually care and want our feedback. And then when you give them feedback – it's actually kind of cool the next year or the year after to actually see them apply changes to their products that, where you could say, yeah, that was something we we had talked about. That was something that, you know, a lot of us wanted to see, and they did it. They actually listened. And, again, it's funny because I, I know you better than anyone listening probably does, but you're a person that doesn't give uh, – you don't sugarcoat things, if, that, if I want to put it that way. Um, Rick is a person that – We'll give a straight. I've been to a bunch of meetings with companies before with them where they're like, you know, what do you think about this product? And everyone's in the crowd going, yeah, it's awesome. I love your bows. I love this. <laughs> and Rick raises his hand. What the hell is up with this? This uh, you know, rubber piece that you're sliding in here or doing this? I'm like, geez, Rick, could you be any more blunt? Or what? Well, like sixty people, they're all like, ah. yeah, why be around the bush? I mean, here we are. Yeah, no, but that's that's what I. You're mean. You're talking is, about the the. The Prime Dealer Summit. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yep. Yeah. I'm just going to be like, so what's with like the uh, the thing <laughs> the here that really flop. seems to flip <laughs> flop that, <laughs> that seems to cause more problems, more headache than it does and better. And hey, they fix that. You know, boom, it's changed. Yeah, it has But changed. if everybody says, oh, no, everything's great, man. Thanks. I love your, your cool apparel line too, sweet sticker, then nothing gets better. 
right? Yeah. So you just got to be, just got to tell them what's up, man. Yep. I do it. I think I do it nicely, at least, professionally. It, 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 professionally, maybe. Nicely is very, I, I don't know how to put the word. Yeah, we wouldn't want it any other way. I, yeah. That's why, that's why I think I learned a lot from working with Rick, because if you have any sort of feelings or a heart or anything like that, you're going to get hurt. You're gonna you're gonna go down. You have That's to be. That's why you're HR and I'm not. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. I was put in charge of HR at at Bucks and Bows Archery with zero authority to change anything. But let's just put it that you way. Had the title. I did have the title, and I still keep that to this day. Hang on one sec. All right, now that that's now that that's out of the way and Rick's fully fueled. Here we go. Um, we're good to go. Let's jump into the next thing here. Let's 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 say, let's talk turkeys. Let's talk turkeys. Let's talk. I can't do it real well. Your turkey gobble sucks. Yeah, I can't gobble either. Alec though can owl hoot. Can owl hoot. Can't go. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Just gonna blow the mic out. No, No, you're good. All right. It's pretty good. Pretty good. That's pretty impressive. (laughs) My 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 throat's a little. Weird today. I can't get the best gobble out. Yeah, the guys in Texas were laughing. I kept, gobbling I kept walking around and gobbling, and they were there making fun of me. They actually <laughs> said it was good though. I, this that better than I can. That and for whatever reason, I always get picked on every freaking lodge and outfitter I go to. I don't know if it's just like I'm easily picked on, but they were like, so I get my boot. My boots are soaked right after walk through this river, and they don't have boot dryers because their boots never get wet because it never rains. So I leave my Solomons out. You know, in like the in the front of the lodge during the day to dry in the sun, and I took the insoles out and kind of left them sitting there too. So the one night we get back, and uh, they're like, "Hey, are your boots dry yet?" I'm like, "I don't know." I didn't check them. I had a pair of backup boots, those snake boots that uh, Rick let me to go down. I'm like, "I don't know, I didn't check." And so Riley, the head guy, is like, "Dude, we're all standing there." He's like, "Dude, listen, I'm gonna finish this beer and I'm going to bed. So let me know because he had some sort of like boot warmers or something." Like to heat up his ski boots when he goes skiing. I don't know if you could do that. Assuming you can't in Texas anywhere, so he travels. But <laughs> he's like, I could lend you those. I'm like, he's like, should go check. I'm like, fine, god damn. I'm like, I'll go check. Like, what's it? What do you care about my boots so much? So like, and they're all like standing there and videoing that I didn't know. And the video's not good for rated anything other than like X because it's choice words after that. But so I go out. I grab my boot. And he's like, I put your insoles, like stuck them, shoved them in your boot because they were blown around in the wind. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go out. I have to take the insole out to put my hand in there. So I pull the insole insole out, and a freaking snake comes out of my boot. I scream. It's a good way to Drop die. my boot. I'm like, you <laughs> beep, you know. And uh, they they tied a rubber snake with fishing string to the insole. So when I pulled it out, the snake popped out of my boot. <laughs> Scared the shit out of me. That's awesome. Then I saw it wasn't a spider. Or dude, you yeah. literally had a heart attack. I would have. Yeah, that would have died. I would have shot my boots. I would have <laughs> find the nearest gun and just shot, just blown my boots apart trying to kill the spider. And then I opened my bow case the next day, and there was another snake tied to the inside of my bow case lid. So I opened up. Snake comes, you know, sliding out. I'm like, God damn, guys. But that's all fun and games. Yeah. You got to have that. So anyway, no, I got back there. But yeah, I don't know how you got on that topic. Yeah. Oh, because well, they, they like my gobbling. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I like, I'm a good gobbler. Uh, you like gobbling stuff. but uh, Alex, Alex, a good hooter. <laughs> hooter. He's a good hooter. I'm a good gobbler. And you're not really good at much. But yeah. Podcasting. Yeah, I I, no, I can talk no. to people that are good at stuff. but He's really good. What was, uh, must rain out the call that he can do? What's the mating call you can do? Oh, the uh, Bob Kitty. <laughs> really getting into this again? <laughs> Bob Kitty mating noise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you see? go. I can't even. That's do what that. you're good at. Yeah, He's good at that and good at growing rut stashes. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even say that either. I mean, no, the center doesn't grow in real well. Oh, it does, but that's burned off by friction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I had. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we went there. All right, there turkey. Let's get on. Let's get on topic here. Talk let's, farm birds. Let's talk farm birds on the on a farm recent podcast that I just did with uh, a farm buddy of mine, Jake Stanish. We talked about hunting big woods and, and mountain turkeys. Now I want to go completely different and talk about hunting farm country birds, which Alec and Rick, Alec, 
Alec has down pretty pretty good here. Right, Alec. It's just what we've always been used to, I guess. I mean, I mean, we do have some timber up there, but I mean, we'll get into them if we find birds that. But I mean, most of it's all farm country, old yeah. pasture fields. Um, that's, I mean, a lot of our scouting is just driving around glassing fields. Um, get out and listen for birds here and there, but um, it's kind of nice that's, to just drive around and. That's the main tactic. Yeah. Yeah. As far as killing those birds i think most of our success over the years has come from oh it's 95 three season oh, yeah. scouting glassing finding birds watching where they're roosting watching where they're flying down and hanging out in the in the mornings and uh you know versus being out there trying to call and locate them and you know in the timber so one of the most interesting things that that i learned from talking to alec specifically on the sand rick is all right so alec you're going out like real early a couple months ahead of time you know you're glassing these fields and checking things out is that is that right yeah yeah um i mean i'm not going hardcore early like i won't go until march and I, I, even march it's very sparingly i mean i'll go around and kind of uh get an inventory of what i'm seeing um seeing where they're flocked out but i mean yeah on x i mean we we've used that a ton with but most of it's like april 1st April 1st, I really start going, like, as much as I can be out there, mornings, evenings. Um, not evenings, not as much, but, I mean, as any morning I can get out there, um, I'll start driving around and really checking out a lot of the spots. And you, you can see from, I mean, you just start to glass fields. But when it gets closer to season, then I'll start kind of um, narrowing in, I guess, on uh, on the spots that we were kind of looking into. So um, you start seeing the birds that they're roosting in and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean. And so w- with that, Alex, so you're riding around, you're finding these birds. That's cool. You're finding birds. Mm-hmm. Everyone can find these birds yep. on these private farm fields. But how do you get access to these places? That's something that's an art in itself. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. It's one thing to find them, but cute, how do you Cute get... little two-year-old kids. Yeah. Yeah, we... Uh... <laughs> Cam. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, let me explain that a little bit. So last year... Me this and Rick... sounded weird. No, nope, nope. nope. let me, let me, okay. so, uh, me and Rick were starting to find, uh, some birds in different fields and, um, properties that we didn't have permission on before and like, didn't know the people. And, uh, we had my daughter cam. She's, she was only like what, one and a half one at the half, time. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, we had her with us driving around and we go up to these, these houses and we would just take her out and carry her up. And who's going to say no when you have a little baby in your arms? Yeah. The first guy did. <laughs> yeah, the first, yeah guy the first guy did. Get your child off my porch. Yeah. No. Yep. No. Nope. Yeah, he was. He was actually. He was aggressive, which very aggressive. Yeah, but did he chest it did work. Yeah. What's that? Did he chest bump you? He, no, nah, he was thinking he, about. He it. thought like it was like the dude thought we were trying to like rob him. Yeah. I'm like, bro, like, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. We're wearing jeans. We're wearing jeans and t-shirts, <laughs> and we have a, a year and a half old baby in our arms. You know, we're no, we're no threat to you. But he acted like real. He was like yeah. tough guy. Like, what are you doing? Can I help you? I'm like, uh, well, we saw you had turkeys. He's like, yeah, no. Like, so we were gonna ask if we could hunt. No. We're like, okay, yeah, we're leaving. But I mean, I guess if you go out out of ten places, he asks, we really don't get no's very often. I mean. You'll, you'll get some here and there. You just can't be afraid to, to ask. I mean, a lot of people are nervous, and but Onyx Maps has been uh, definitely a game changer as far as getting permissions and, and finding out. Name. It gives you the name. So you could walk up and say, hey, are you are you Mr. Miller? Are you Bob Miller? Uh, yeah. Yes, I am. Hey, we're, this is Alec. I'm Ricky. You know, we, we, look, we looked at your property. We see you own... You know, 127 this acres. This is our daughter. Yeah, this is our daughter. <laughs> this is our daughter, Cam. And so we saw that you owned, you know, you owned 127 acres. We did a little research, and we were thinking, you know, that we'd like to turkey hunt your property if that was okay, um, just for this year. We just look in turkey. See, not, hey, can we hunt here? It's can we turkey hunt here this year? And I think people are a little more apt to say yes with turkey hunting versus deer hunting or anything else yeah and i'm sure that can be a way too. like once you get to know those people and create that relationship it might even turn into more can build into more yep and even if you find spots too that um i've never personally done this but i'm sure it'd be a great tactic i mean if you find a place that has a lot of birds or anything like that but they're still kind of on the fence with it usually a lot of people will let you groundhog hunt 
farmers don't like groundhogs. Uh, you can get into small game and stuff like that and build that relationship even more from a lower end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just can't be scared to ask. You it know is I mean? weird though. It's kind of every time you walk up to some oh, couch you've never you been to. It's, I'll be honest, I first, get like anxiety over yeah, doing it. I I the first do. one every year Sweat. for me makes me very, very nervous. But once you start doing it, it's hi, like, hi, like, hi, hi. Can I hunt your property, please? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, but once hi, you I'm start Malik, asking, I'm Malik Nebel. <laughs> Malik. <laughs> Malik. It'll start getting easier and easier. But um, it does once you get once you get a couple of no's. And you kind of get like mad about it. You're like, "F this, dog, dog, dog." Hey, can we turkey on your property because you're expecting a no? Then you get a yes. You're like, "Oh, oh, nice, awesome, thank Sweet. you, wow, oh, thank you so Would much." Would you like sir. a cupcake? Yes, we have strudels. And you gotta park. be polite too. I mean, I'm. It, you got like these older people that I mean, they own a lot of farms out there, and uh, if you just they've give been them screwed a little, by other hunters. Exactly, and you just you can't give them attitude. Just you, you be polite to them and. Nine times out of ten, you can get permission. Do you let him know, like, your success rate and everything when you no, walk up? No. <laughs> no. He's got a resume. Yeah. yeah. Can, <laughs> obviously, you probably know who I am. If you've seen anything I know you're hunting, familiar. If you watch the Outdoor Channel, my name is Alec Neville. Yes, I'll sign your hat after this conversation, and you give me permission to hunt turkeys. Yeah. And, and then he goes, and you, don't even, and, and you don't even have to pay me. So <laughs> honestly, I'll do this for free, <laughs> but just for you, yeah. your neighbors though, I didn't make that same deal with, so oh, just sh- like, you know, this is special. No, but seriously, that's, that's an art to it. And that's a huge part of, of being able to gain, you know, that access to those places. Cause if you can find turkeys, but you can't hunt them at all, then yeah, it's, it's not doing you any good. Nope. Nope. And I mean, we do, there is some public property that we do kind of hunt, but I mean, I'd say a good 95% of it's always private ground. We found farms. some birds on public. Yep. 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 And a lot of it, we've actually, uh, last year was a big one, was using the Hunter Access Program through the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Yeah. That, uh, they have some good spots. Yep. And you run into other people, and let me tell you, freaking turkey hunting around other Pennsylvania hunters. It can be dangerous. It's almost like I want to have Blaze Orange on walking yep. around because you got to watch out. Yep. Be careful with your setup. It does kind of change your tactics a little bit when you know there's other people there because you got to be really, really careful with... Even One, we don't want to mess with our hunters up, mm-hmm. you know. The last thing I want to do is have a guy who spent a bunch of time roosting a bird, you know, for the past couple days or whatever, got up early, gets out there, and, you know, you come strolling through and ruin his hunt. That's not cool. Yeah. I don't want that to happen to me, and I'm, I surely don't want to do it to anybody else. So. Yep. No, I, I completely understand that. Yeah, and so after you're finding these birds and everything, what what are you doing from that standpoint? You get you g- gain the access, you gain permission. How are you putting together a game plan for shoot them in the face? Day? <laughs> shoot them in the face. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you're you're going to continue to. I mean, if if say season opens on a Saturday and you try to gain that com- permission prior, I mean weeks weeks ahead of time. Even if those birds aren't going to even be there, like you're there now, gain the permission because two weeks into season they might show back up, and you already have that permission. But if you if you get the permission. You just kind of keep scouting them till opening day. Say they do the same thing, and a lot of it's not even roosting them and finding out where they're they're in the tree. Um, say you're driving at this area at seven forty five, eight o'clock in the morning, and every single morning they're roughly around this area. Um, you're gonna go in and just set up and and wait them out. I mean, you can you, you're gonna do a little calling too, but I mean. Technically, it's not. It's not like you're deer hunting them, but you kind of are. We've we've yeah. made that comment. We're deer hunting these birds yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Set up a blind. You know they're going to get there. You're patterning them. Set yeah. up. Extent. Correct. Set up. It's like early season down, whitetails, pretty much. Yeah. The way we're hunting them. Yep. So um, it's W. And that's that's so crazy. Like it's different than, you know, like a lot of the places that I hunt. I've hunted farm birds, which I think they're all equally difficult. They just have their different challenges. Yeah. And but like. A lot of it for for me has to do on roosting, like finding them, because otherwise you're not spotting them, no, you know, no. in in the timber that much, and unless you're, you know, you're timber running. yodelers. What's that? Timber yodelers. Timber, yeah, exactly. You're you're waiting to hear them sound off and move, but with with you guys, you're a little bit more of a strategic planning, and there's a like you said, there's. I I don't know how to give this a percentage. Maybe you'd be able to, but there, I feel like there's a lot more scouting than the hunting oh, portion of it's it. It's 95% of it. Your success is, I don't even That's say that. That's a pretty bold statement. It, it's, it's, I'd say 100% on your scouting. 
if you're not scouting and you don't know the birds are and you're not setting up on them right, I mean, yeah, you might get lucky every once in a while, but you're you're putting luck in your favor if you if you know where they're going to be. So yeah. You got to do your scouting, and uh, I mean, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Are you are you doing a lot of run and gun setups? You doing ground blinds, or does it all depend on the um, situation? It all depends. Corn piles. Corn piles. Yeah. <laughs> it all it, it all depends. Uh, there's a lot of times that we'll set up a ground blind and say we're seeing birds at nine o'clock in the morning or so. You can. Uh, I mean, normally we wouldn't set up on something like that. We I'm try joking. To... It's game commission's listening. <laughs> yeah. No corn piles. Every, no corn. All all my guests joke about. I had Clint Casper on the other day, and he kept joking. Yeah. Everywhere <laughs> we go, like we find a spot in the big woods. He's like. All right, you get up, you get the thermals coming up over the hill, you set your ground blind here, you put your corn pile here, and you're good to go. And I'm like, Clint, everyone's going to think It's pretty that. convincing. Yeah. You have to believe it. Man. But anyways, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of the spots that we're hunting in the morning, I mean, you're, you're seeing birds there early. So you know they're not roosting far from there. You set up, I mean, depending on the area, I mean, you could set up um, right on the edge of the timber or whatever. But a lot of time, it's, it's open fields. Jeez. Jeez, he's got a big motor. Yeah, I don't know if anybody could hear that in the background. Wow, that's so impressive. Um, but a lot of it's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it's open fields, so we're setting up ground blinds, and and you can hunt them with archery. But and it's tough getting to those birds sometimes because a lot of times these landowners only have the field and won't have the timber. Yep. So okay, you so you can't come through the timber using the timber as cover in the morning in the dark. Granted, yeah, turkeys like don't see really well at dark you know in the dark or whatever but you can't just walk through an open field no. you know especially if the moon's out it's a clear morning you stand out like you a sore thumb so you gotta try to get on the edge of that we try to get as close as we, we've set up pretty much right under you know, that that uh plowed field bird oh, yeah. you killed i mean god we could pretty much we, see uh, him as roost yeah, a lot of times they were further away we got up and walked right up to it and there was a bird there was a bird uh, set up right in right above us, and we, we had to stop, and we set the decoys out, and it ended up being like eight yards, which yeah, was a little crawling. closer than we wanted to. Remember, we had to crawl out into the field because we were afraid he was going to yeah, see us. Yeah, we didn't know we didn't know what uh, what it was, and it ended up not being the gobbler, and it being a hen. Yeah. And uh, thank for that, but I mean, we ended up killing that bird at eight yards. But she saw us. She saw us. She, she never. That, she never. She stayed in that freaking tree till eight o'clock. We killed him at what six fifteen something like that. Oh, was that a, that early? It was pretty early. Okay, I mean, so she stayed. Down. But she, every other bird flew down except for her. She stayed an, oh, an hour after we shot. Fly down, yeah. yeah. We shot and like we didn't even fly down until we got up to the bird. But um, yeah, I mean, it all depends. The terrain, the terrain features is a big one, um, and walking up to him and getting up to him uh, without being caught. So. We've killed some. We killed a t- I, that bird. I killed last year. Caught, kind of called a timber bird, but yeah, I missed that. That's one a last running gun thing. The, That's what the. the um, I mean, yeah, we do a lot of field setups early in the morning and stuff like that. But I mean, midday, um, you get that nine to nine to noon. Um, we do a lot of running and gunning in the timber. I mean, it's not as much farmland birds as much yeah. as um, as we do hit the timber. So I'd say that's a big portion of like what we're doing. Yeah, in the second half of the season when you can hunt. You know, throughout the day, you don't have to be out of there at noon. Obviously, you're not going to walk around a field no. at one o'clock in the afternoon, hammering on a box call. Those birds are most likely in the timber. They tend to go to ridges. We found in that midday. You know, those hens go back to nest. Those gobblers midday hunting for turkeys is between eleven and let's say eleven and one, eleven and two is some killer time to kill birds because that's rare for most people are napping at that point yeah but if, okay. if you can hunt midday get out there midday i've actually i have some buddies and i've talked to some experienced turkey hunters say screw waking up early they'd rather wake up nine o'clock get out there at 10 and hunt from 10 to 2 because it's a better opportunity to kill a bird the hens are on the on the nest or their the hens have moved on right they've left the gobblers now those birds are going to get normally higher up on the ridges, and our hunting in Kentucky proved that to be 100% true. Midday, every long beard's on top of a ridge because he feels like he's more visible. He can strut. You know, he can – more more hens can see him from up there, right? It's like it's like anything else. You're higher up. He can see more. Um, yeah, midday, get in the timber, get on a ridge, work it, call it. Well, that's – it's funny. Like, my that's something my – 
grandpa always says he's 72 years old now and still kills a big gobbler every year and he doesn't go out till 8 30 9 o'clock in the morning he always jokes he goes i let the he goes i let the newbies and everything go out and mess with them in the morning and yeah. then i go out and kill them later and he, he loves that you can get one morning you to, get one to early answer. afternoon you know you get one to answer between 9 10 11 o'clock like that you have a really good chance of calling that bird up should the one i killed in tech that rio i just killed i killed him at six o'clock in the evening yeah, that well, yeah because we ate at four. I've, yeah, ne- I've never o'clock. killed one in the evening since the Pennsylvania. That was my first evening bird. I don't remember when did they open that up in Pennsylvania <sighs> for evening hunting. It was five years ago. I was going to say four to five years ago. Yeah. I've tried don't, and I've come yeah, close only to one that. time. If I've, you know where they're roosting, yeah, it's deer hunting them. Right there, there's your deer hunt for turkeys. If you know where they're going to roost, because they tend to pattern pretty, you know, um, consistently as far as their roost trees are concerned. Go set up under a roost tree or near a roost tree. Put a decoy out. Don't put a decoy out. Whatever you want to do, and 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 wait for them. They're going to be there. They tend to come to the roost trees, at least around them, pretty early, and they'll hang out and screw around yep. for at least an hour before going to roost. So you can. It's not like this like last light thing where you're going to kill them. You know, right before they fly. As they're up. flying up, you shoot them out of the trees, though, don't you? <laughs> Honestly, it's <laughs> they have bad vision at night. So if you wait till dark and you use like a red light, you hook a red light to your bow like we were hog hunting in Texas, and you just aim at the trees. A lot of people don't know this, but turkeys' eyes glow green at night, like under a red light. So you could see them from like you know three hundred yards away. And that's perfect range for your for your PSE. Well, what do you mean two forty three? Yeah, AR, <laughs> AR-15. <laughs> yeah. Guys, we're 100% joking. Yeah, this is a joke. By the way. If you shoot them with a two forty three, <laughs> you don't even have to cut their fan off or their beard. It'll literally just be a fan and a beard laying at the bottom of the tree. Pick them up, go. You don't even need to pack out the meat. Spurs are sitting there. It just, yeah. light. Put just it up. in your pocket and go shoot another you one. You put the fan on your head and you walk out. <laughs> reaping. That's reaping. Reaping. Yeah. All right. On a serious note, you mentioned something about decoys. Are you guys using decoys much? Yeah, yeah, we're using decoys. Um, there, there is times in uh, running gun situations that we don't, we might not. But um, yeah, those are the early morning sits on the field edges. I mean, we're running decoys, not like crazy flocks or anything like that. Simple Jake hen setups. About four, four hens, two Jakes, and, a, and a, like a full strike gobbler. <laughs> it's like waterfowl hunting. I was actually just listening. <laughs> I was just listening to a podcast on the way down here where they were discussing. This was uh, with DS. With DSD, and they were talking about that white face decoy that, and the guy was talking about running like ten decoys at a time, and I was like, I thought he was joking at first, but he was dead serious. That he's like, oh yeah, the early seasons you you can run like ten decoys. He he said it was like one time they did that, but most like he said I'll run four four hens and a Jake and stuff like that. And I'm like, most of the time, well, so I ain't trying to carry that many decoys. No, no, that's a pain in the ass. But we use Avian X; they're yeah. affordable. You know, as far as quality decoys are uh, concerned, inflatable, so you can pack them down. Super realistic. They're super realistic. Yep. Crazy yeah. realistic. That's what I, I use that. Just don't that shoot breeder them. breeder hen. The only problem I have with the breeder, sometimes if it gets later in the season, in the timber with the ferns that grow up, it's You mean the, the lay down? The lay down, is that what it is? Lay down hen? Yeah. yeah when she's laying down. Yep, that's the one. That's yeah, the one later in the season, she's hard to use. Even yeah, if you use that tall grass. In, yeah, short grass. Yeah. Plowed, plowed fields, she's good with. Put... Put her with like a strutting Jake or a you know quarter strut Jake or yep. something. It's a pretty awesome combination. Well, the bird uh, Limpy that she killed, we had that set up. It was quarter strut Jake with a um, with the lay down laying there, and it, she he jumped up on top of the lay down, yeah, shot her right off. Her. Really, yeah, shot her right off the top of her. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, you had that on video, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. We used to film all our turkey hunts when we had that uh, TV show, that Pittsburgh TV show we did. Um, but yeah, you kind of got away some from awesome film that needs to get out there at some point. Get a lot, yeah. I like to put. We filmed, I filmed film. your bird last year. Snapchat, yeah, live. Snapchat, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, fun. and you didn't save any of it. I have you it. Know? Yeah, he has. I have it, it on my you? phone. And then I sent it, and since we were in, you know, like BFE, it's like parts of it are coming through, and then like the. It's coming in, then like the after the shot went through, but nobody saw anything. In yeah, between. they're like, "What's <laughs> it was going like coming on?" Coming through, real sporadic. That's uh, classic. Oh, I love watching your country. guys' turkey hunts on Snapchat last year. Try to document them pretty well. Yeah, I sent <laughs> all on Snapchat. I'm like, that was when I was running the social media for Bucks and Bows. I was like, Rick, 
upload these as Instagram stories so everyone except for just more people than just us can see that. That was amazing. Not until this year did I really figure out Instagram. You still haven't, but I yeah. Still, I, yeah, I still haven't. <laughs> I still click on things like people sent you an attachment, and then it says this attachment's attachment. unavailable. Yeah, attachment. Oh, yeah. That, yeah that, you know what I mean? That, like, that, it's that, like a paper plane. Private. Yeah. That, it's <laughs> like a little paper plane in the corner. I'm like <laughs> A paper clip? What is yeah, this? Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> then you had to push another button. I'm like, oh, this Instagram stuff. He's just is... an old man. He doesn't know yet. <laughs> wow. I'm in my 30s now. I know. I know. That's serious. Riley, what is so funny? I think we're going to have to bury him before the end of the night. Yeah, probably. No, I'll, I'll I'll do it on live live Twitter feed next year. <laughs> you can get it you on your MySpace him. profile. That's one thing I don't have. Yeah. He's gonna he's gonna upload. Never understood MySpace. Twitter. MySpace. Yeah. yeah, he's gonna upload his MySpace profile song. <laughs> My Instagram. We can do live Instagram. Can I get some followers out of this? Can. Yeah, Ricky Bob four five. <laughs> At, hashtag shake and bake. I I. I yeah, when you go to do your live feed, text me and I'll show me how. Yeah, yeah, I'll get get some people to go over there and watch it. Yeah, it'll be like two people watching, and it'll be like my mom and my sister. And <laughs> like, hey, mom. Yeah. Thanks Shout for out. watching. Shout out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, those videos were absolutely awesome, and that that you videoed of Alec and and everything else, and and your guys' actual film that isn't on a cell phone yes. is. Pretty damn awesome. We've got some pretty cool footage. Yeah, like some really, really good turkey. It's a little easier, especially if you're in a blind. You can get away with a lot more movement. You get away with a lot more equipment. And so call them in. Once they get to the decoys, we would let them play for a little bit. We'd always, you know, try to be like, all right, dude, let them, you know, get some footage and stuff like that. You get some really cool footage. Um, We actually, so I have this um, flex tone. It's like a shell of a, of a, um, Jake, and then you put a real. We have a real Jake fan that we hook on it, and on the very top of it is like a. It's like an all thread. It's like the stake that goes in the ground, and we connected it to the AVNX Lifeline 360, so you can actually control the strutter, and make them spin like a puppet from the inside the blind with with these cords. So on top of that, we put my Garmin Verb action cam facing forward and so a bird would come in to the decoys you could just you could turn our decoy and make it face the you know the real turkey and he's like two feet away and the and the camera's right there and you're obviously controlling it with your phone so we actually got some pretty cool footage of like he's getting shot in the stuff. face at like two feet from the camera yeah from an action cam we got yeah, some really good footage cool. we need to put together yeah one of these days i'll put together a whole little teaser but yeah. If I ever have time. saying that. He says, I'm going to put a teaser together. Yeah, but he doesn't do anything. That hey. bothers me. It's all talk. I hate people that are all talk. Shh. Yeah. Work too much, are. man. Slide a little Unreal. bit. Unreal. Unreal. <laughs> One of these days. One of these days. We'll do it. Yeah. You definitely need He's to. too busy editing weddings. And yeah. if you need a photographer, call Alec Nebel. Yeah. Nebel Images. Nebel Images. Yeah. yeah. It's mainly my wife, but... Do yeah, it's, yeah, she does it's really all good Shauna. work. It's all Shauna. It's all Shauna. She's an editing freak. And she's, she's just it. good at everything where you're good I'm at mediocre being with at her. Best. Yep. Yeah, right. yeah. I'm not even good at that. Let's be honest. Yeah, <laughs> he but. Can, the only thing Alec can do really well too, not the only thing, but one of the second thing he can do really well than <laughs> killing turkeys, and that would be the last thing too, um, is cooking bomb ass grilled cheeses with tomato oh. soup. Listen, grilled cheese and tomato soup. That's turkey that's, camp. That's turkey lunch. camp. And it's good stuff. You get some tomato soup and grilled cheese. And if we can get morels. Grilled cheese or grilled? Grilled oh. cheese. <laughs> and you can get some morels with that too. Yeah, oh. morels. Oh. Oh, I forgot we did that with those morels. Yeah. Morel mushrooms. Yeah, you get those on your farm. No, I don't. What are you talking about? I mean, no, you don't. <laughs> God damn. Yeah, my farm in Alabama. Yeah. That lease we have. Yep, that that's lease. where we get them. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyways uh on the back on the turkey side of things so you know we we talked about like how you're scouting them how you're setting up your your methods of hunting using decoys everything else what are is there any other thing else that that you guys are doing that kind of sets you apart because every year in the first couple of days you guys are tagged out or at least have your first tags filled what what are you doing different because turkey hunting is not easy no matter 
you know what? I mean, I think in the Western states it's a little different. People look at them like they're like, how you guys go out and you, you know, Pennsylvania you serious a, a people sport. are serious turkey hunters. Well, and and I think and this isn't even just being, um, you know, biased to because I live in Pennsylvania, but from everyone I talk to, the turkeys out in some of like the Western states and Montana and stuff, they're like the easiest things in the world to call yeah. in. Most, Here, most, they're, they're difficult. Yep. I'd say Miri- biggest... Miriam's or Rio's, Rio's in particular are, I mean, I've heard, and obviously within 24 hours, we were able to kill one when I was there. I don't want to say easy, but I'd say the biggest... way easier, way easier than an Eastern, at least a Pennsylvania Eastern. I'd say the biggest part of that um, is pressure. Sure. I, uh, I think you can make any subspecies of turkey hard to hunt, like an Osceola turkey. Everybody's like a man. They're they're a hard turkey to kill. It's because everybody and their brother has well, to go. There's not to, a lot of them. There's not well, a lot of them. There's not a there's not a big area of them. Yeah, and everybody so a, and their brother yep, out of goes there. Whole United States are going to one little small area to chase after this bird. So it's very pressured bird. I think honestly, for us, as far as how to continually have success, and it's going to sound super cliche, is keep hunting them. So like we, he, Alec, you killed that bird two years ago. I mean, I'm I'm on my watch. Um, it's you know it's eleven fifty seven or something. Eleven forty five. Eleven forty five, and I'm sitting there like, dude, you, we have fifteen minutes, and everybody else is home already. It's almost noon. It's it's damn near the middle of the day. Everyone else has said, oh, I didn't kill. We didn't kill him by nine. They're back at the house sleeping. We're still in the woods hunting, and he shoots a long beard in the face at. You know, eleven forty-five. Yeah, it was like know, 10, ten minutes. Ten minutes before we were not allowed to hunt them anymore. We don't go back to the house unless it's noon, or we have dead turkeys, or we have dead truck. turkeys. That's it. We'll just keep hunting them. Keep yeah. drive around. Get on. Get on. Get your boots on the ground. Start covering ground. Calling. Find birds and kill them. Simple. I mean, if you're if yeah if you're home at nine thirty ten o'clock going oh, I didn't kill any turkeys this morning. Well, then you're not going to kill one at home. Patience. You... Patience is a big one and persistence. Yep. I just keep after it and don't get down. I mean, you could go to Turkey you could go to fun. five different spots and not hear a bird. And that sixth spot, you'll you'll find. And a then whole that's bottle. that's a, you, know, you said it's a cliche statement, and yeah, maybe it is, but there's a reason for it to be that way because sure. you can't. And it goes that way with any sort of hunting. You know, the more yep. time you put, you can't kill them by not hunting them. Nope. Yep. You know, I think too many people though think that you know. If you don't kill them when they fly down and then walk into your decoys in the morning, if you don't kill them then, then you're not going to kill them. Yeah. They're, they're like, oh, well, I guess we'll hunt tomorrow morning. Was it was it last year you guys struggled a little bit? Was it last year or a couple years ago? Well, you killed one. Or maybe you killed one on Monday. I we didn't kill one, one on opening mo- day. No, we haven't killed one on opening day in a while. You killed Monday. I killed Monday. I've killed one on Monday after opening day five years in a row. You killed Monday. I killed Tuesday. You killed Tuesday. And went, then I killed Thursday. Killed, went, yeah. Tuesday and Thursday, I killed both my birds. You killed Monday. I just Monday. remember one year, though, that it was like most years you guys are just stacking them up right at the beginning. It seems like anyways. And from me, when I'm at work and you guys have your first few days off of the season, you're just killing shit. But uh, there was a couple years ago, whenever it was. That you struggled, but it was just constant staying after. Might it. have been weather or something. I, I think yeah. it was it was in between weather, and I think it was a lot of uh, dealing with other other hunters as well. I think we were running in a lot of we guys. Did, we did have a year where we seemed like we couldn't find property that but wasn't the biggest hunted. part. I'd say the biggest part of getting around that, and what is probably a good reason why we're successful is lining up multiple spots. Don't only have like, Oh, these are the birds and you keep watching them. Okay. When I do my scouting in the mornings and I'll be going tomorrow morning and, um, I'll go to one spot, find birds, keep driving to another spot, find more birds, find like get five or six different spots lined up. And then if one doesn't work out or you get there and there's another hunter there, move on to the next one. You got backup plans. So, and you can line that up for multiple days as well. I think another big part of success for us is woodsmanship, and that's something that Alex super strong on. And that part of that scouting is getting not only glassing these birds, but getting your boots on the ground and knowing the lay of the land. Yeah. Turkeys, you know, but you know, people here you can't call them across the creek, can't call them through a barbed wire fence, and sometimes you can, or you but can't call them down a hill, right? Find a way across, but trying to get on this level. 
if you know where those barriers are or you know the lay of the land and you say, oh, well, I don't want to, you don't want to put that in between you and the bird, you're going to have more success. You know, Alec, we almost killed those birds. Yeah, last, last year was year a perfect example on of that. On opening day, I think it was, we were driving around. Yep. We, we found those birds and we see birds. We drive freaking a mile and a half to the other side of the property to come in from the other way. And Alec literally goes, we got to get to this corner of the field and drop down to this bottom. I'm like, dude, are you sure? Like, I just, you know, I, I think maybe we should do this. He's like, no, I'm telling you. I'm like, all right, cool. He knows what he's doing. So we get down there and dude, we literally get to the spot where Alec wants to stand. He calls, they gobble, they're at 35 yards. Yeah, we didn't have time to set up. Like, we, we literally just, sat down. Just sat down in the middle of the woods. Didn't even have a tree to lean against. Just sat straight down in the leaves and put our guns up. And those birds walked within 10, yards? 15 yards of yeah. us. It looked, it was Jake, Jake. Not sure. Wasn't sure on the third one. And so we figured, well, it's probably all three Jakes. We're like, God damn. So they come up behind us. And we're standing there. We're talking. We're like, all right, let's get going. Let's go back to the truck. We come up into the field behind us, and they're standing in the field. Oh, that third one had like a freaking 10-inch beard. Big old rope. Second, we get up in the field. Pop, pop, and they fly off. And But why would why would you ever think two Jakes two would Jakes be and a long beard. long beard? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, just- but it worked, and his woodsmanship was able to put us in a position to have turkeys in our lap within minutes. Yeah. That was just a, knowing the lay of the land. That was a midday. That was like a 9, 30, 10 yeah. o'clock. Yep. Kind and of what's deal. nice now, I mean, like again, with things like Onyx and everything is you might not be super familiar with the property, but you can look at the topo maps and the aerial overlay on that and be able to tell, all right, there's a point coming out here or they're come, they're up here. We're down here. They might not come down here across yeah, this creek. Absolutely. Over. You know, well, but you know, a lot of that is are a big thing. I mean, prime example in Texas, yeah. he's hanging up behind me. I don't know why until I get out there and go, this is my first time in that spot. Oh, crap. There's a barbed wire fence here. Yeah. yeah. You know, I would have totally changed my tactics immediately from the beginning had I known that was there. Yep. Um, luckily, it still worked. But, yeah, I mean, turkeys are finicky. Yeah. Stuff like that. But season's coming up. I'm getting all go. fired up for it. Yeah, I'm getting so fired up. So the question I wanted to ask you guys here before we No, I will not make out with you. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, you couldn't be that lucky. What a loser. <laughs> what a weirdo. <laughs> um. I was going to ask, I, I want you guys to come hunt with me sometime. No. No? Why? Okay. I'll come kill your turkeys. Hey, I want <laughs> I want you to. I I know you. I think you'll just have fun doing it. I'm I think it'll be I'm fun. I'm putting it more as a challenge. No. Saying, I, challenge I think he's saying them. that we don't we don't have the capability he's to kill He's saying, oh, birds. you can kill these birds in these farm fields. Come and, down and yeah. kill my birds. I would love to hunt. I'd with actually you, really enjoy that too. I think it it'd be, be a definitely. Uh, I think we would do more fun. screwing around than actually hunting. Oh, well. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we would. I'd but have to get in a little better shape too. I think you'd be fine. We, we, you'd be fine. If you stick to my diet plan, a workout regimen, and you look like me, which Same. I can help you with, okay, for okay. minimal cost, you know, to kind of forty nine ninety nine a month. Yeah, fifty sixty bucks a month. <laughs> Calls it the Black Bear plan. <laughs> yeah. Yep, <laughs> where you pretty much lay around and hibernate. You have to save up your energy and store it in your body. For because season. when I get on turkey hunts, I can go for days without eating because I have all my food nutrients stored in my belly already. <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but seriously, I th- I want you guys to come Thank hunt yours. with me. And then I'm saying this because hopefully you reciprocate it and – Kill you know, some farm birds. Kill some farm birds, and we can just have. Let's a do it. I'm down for that. I mean, it it'd be definitely a different uh, atmosphere than what I'm used to. Yeah, I'd, it'd be fun. Really we'll enjoy do it. A, make a camping trip out of it. You know, I mean, I know it's tough. With can you I sleep with you in your James Brew tent again? You never did in the first place. I again when we went camping, you slept. You in keep your telling own tent. people that that didn't happen, but. <sighs> God. Well, we'll right. do that, and then we'll, we'll have to have a whole nother podcast to, to come out with what happened there. But you know, yeah, that'll be on a. I think we should do uh, a little western trip station. too. What? Maybe do a little bit of Miriam Western trip. That would be fun. Head out Wyoming, Montana, something like that. Well, we're going to Texas. Yeah, Texas next year. We're going to Texas next year, and then I met a kid in Texas, Chase. Really cool dude. Lives in Florida. Runs a shop out of Florida. Uh oh. He's got Osceola's, and he said he's never killed an Eastern. I said, okay, so you get me an Osceola, and I'll get you an Eastern. And he was like, deal. 
Damn. And we got a place to stay at your parents' place. Yeah. So Osceola's are next. Miriam's would be fun. We should go out there. I think a little Western do-it-yourself Miriam trip. Montana. Kelly from Tight Spot said that we come out and kill Miriam's. He's got Miriam's out there in Montana. 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 I said. Take Martania to Montana, killing Miriam's. <laughs> 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 all right well Perfect. it sounds like a plan we should talk like that so do you guys have any closing thoughts anything else you want to leave anybody with here i got one for you so i know you like reading books you and can't i can't read but yeah well audio <laughs> that's why he listens to podcasts Audiobooks. i have a book that you should read i just recently read it from um colonel tom kelly um it's the uh 10th uh 10th Is that legion like a character on spongebob 10th <laughs> legion read it It'll change your perspective on turkey hunting. Okay. I would I'd Honestly, give it a read. this guy, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so repeat that again for the listeners. What Tom was, Kelly. Tom Kelly. The 10th Legion. The 10th Legion. Yeah. Bush. If you're a, a hardcore turkey hunter, you'll be you'll be totally into it. It's a really good book. Awesome. What about you, Rick? Do you have any closing thoughts besides opening another bush can before you black out? Or back out? And we don't back out. No, we don't. <laughs> That's another no, big part just of it. good luck. Turkey season, everybody. Have fun. Turkey season's the best. It's life. It's better than anything else. So have fun. Kill turkeys and be freaking safe. I mean, I know people personally who have been shot while turkey hunting and have life changing, altering um, injuries from that where they're not able to really uh, live a normal life anymore from getting shot. So human beings, a, a 200 pound. 180 pound human being does not look like a 18 pound turkey by any stretch of the imagination, no matter really what you do. Even if you were dressed as a turkey, there are no 200 pound turkeys out there. So do not shoot people. Uh, be sure of your target. No, that's, that's a, let them go so they can grow. That's it. No Jake's Sean Fuchs. (laughs) Jake's for kids. Full fan dead. Yep. Keystone. Just go have fun. Shoot them. And be persistent. And if you can't kill a turkey, just give up. All right. Anything else, <laughs> Rick? No, actually, I'm done. Actually, we're closing this off from Rick. Um, where can where can people find anything more from you guys, um, Rick? I know you're not extremely active on social media, but honestly, w- check out my Twitter. <laughs> tweet me, Instagram. S- slide into your DMs. Slide in my DMs. Snapchat, Vimeo. Actually, I'm just going to respond for Rick. Facebook. Yeah, you can check out the Bucks and Bows Archery Facebook and Instagram page, as well as Ricky Bobby. 40, Ricky Bob 45. Ricky Bob 45 on Hashtag the Shake IG. and Bake. And Alec, what about yourself? Um, you can find me on Facebook, I guess, uh, Alec Nebel. And uh, Instagram, uh, A underscore Nebel. And... Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the only platforms I'm on. So uh, post some turkey hunt stuff here and there. Farmers only. Farmersonly.com. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Well, we're going to check out my here. Blumble page. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks right. for having us, Bo. Yeah, Appreciate you. Yeah, it. thanks. We have some beer to drink. Thanks yeah. for the East Meets West Good hats. luck this spring, buddy. Yep. You too, man. Thanks, See ya. Bro. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.